Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this uh, great talk, looking uh, into the past, looking to the future, and uh, I, it's really, really great uh, to have you here. Thank you very much again. I have many questions. There are many questions from the from the audience. So as as usual, I'll start with some some questions myself. You may, you mentioned this issue of simulation. There is this. Uh, actually, me, let me backtrack a bit. I think it's it's very interesting that you end the talk uh, bringing to attention this interdisciplinary uh, aspect of conceptual modeling and the uh, and the fact that conceptual modeling is often. And manifest in different communities by different names as well. So many of what people do in, in uh, of course, in, in ontology and in other representation is conceptual modeling. Uh, but what people do in simulations as well, there is the traditional winter simulation symposium, which goes even further back in time than ER. It's from the 60s, right? And uh, I was thinking that another thing that you mentioned is notion of active conceptual models. Uh, this seems very, very similar to digital twins, right? To this, as uh, people uh, talk about digital twins as if they were something completely new, but at least, I mean, of course, this is a very overloaded concept and people mean different things, but many of what I see people referring to as a digital twin seems to me like an active conceptual model. And I'd like to hear you on that. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um... <clears throat> It's something um, you know, instead of a static model, because the things are changing. Okay, you look at the uh, so-called manufacturing environment. So you have many things coming to uh, the, the plant. Okay, so the raw material. You look at that. It maybe uh, <clears throat> wood or coal or, or steel, whatever. But when you get into the, some kind of a uh, plane where the machine would crack that and creating another entities. So the entities are changing. And uh, even that, or even a chemical reaction, the chemical, you can see you have oxygen coming with the nitrogen uh, together, okay, with some other things. You know, when the right temperature, right condition, it will change, but change could be instantly or could be slowly. And slowly, so it's a different kind of thing. It's partial you know, in this state and partial in that state. So that's the type of thing I think uh, things are happening. So we need to model that. Absolutely. Right. Uh, so let me go back a little bit uh, back in time. Um, you, you did your PhD in, uh, so your undergrad was in electrical engineering, uh, right? And then yes. you worked on things which are very much uh, computer science, uh, mainstream computer science, like uh, file location, uh, load balancing, and so on. Then you moved yes. to uh, to business schools, to SLOM, and then when you were at uh, UCLA, you were also in a business school, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right. So my question is, uh, so, so you start organizing, uh, the, you organize the first CR conference and you, you publish the ER paper while uh, at a business school and coming from a business school from, from MIT Sloan. So the question is, was that uh, important? Uh, to, to, to what degree that uh, influenced your ideas in proposing, uh, in proposing ER, right? So, uh, so the first part of the question is, did you find more echo for that type of research in business school as opposed to computer science schools? And if that business perspective influenced both the practicality and the, uh, let's say, parsimonious aspect of ER in the design of ER? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> I think uh, in my talk, you know, one of the slides, I also briefly mentioned that, you know, basically, um, when I was, I went to, after I get a PhD, that's a mathematical type of thing, and nothing to talk about conceptual model. And then I went to the Honeywell, that's basically a computer uh, vendor for developing uh, hardware software. So it's very science oriented. And even though I was in a group, architecture and uh, database group, okay? 
So, but that's a hard core computer science type of thing. Uh, then I moved to the MIT Sloan School of Management. That's a business school. So, yeah. And the good thing is I learned the, you know, the, the user needs because the student, most of them have experience. You know, and it's not just graduate, just graduate from college. You also have the two years for three years. Then you have the middle manager, also have experience. Then also we have the, some kind of quasi consulting assignment, uh, talk to different companies, and also have this summer courses. Summer courses with the um, um, companies, okay? So we interact with a lot of companies. So in that place, trigger me to think about the practical, practicality. Now, so this is the trigger about thinking about the model, talking about the, the usefulness, okay, as I emphasize several times, different angles of the success factor. Now, uh, many people, I think, probably listen to this talk, uh, either PhD student or later on we go to academic field. So one of the critical things is the tenure decision, okay? So maybe they would concern about that. It's, I already briefly mentioned about that, okay? People say, if you forget about that, get to forget about the EMR, they you do know, either implement relational databases, some prototype or XYZ prototype, okay? Now, so let me tell you, the, say something here to answer your question. It's basically um, in the business school, I have to be more practical, be more, okay? Uh, so we cannot play the hardcore computer scientist, okay? Because during my interview with the dean of Sloan School, he asked me the question, certainly many questions. And one of the questions is, say, can you teach probability and statistics without mathematical symbols? Mm -hmm. Okay, the answer, is, the answer was yes. Otherwise, we'll be higher. Okay. okay. So, so you have to understand that kind of environment. Okay. Certainly, I think MIT Summer School is more technical in this than other management schools. Okay. Uh, but it's still like you know, interesting thing is uh, even at that time we have two professors, senior professors, coming from the WE department of MIT moved to Sloan School. Professor Donovan, Professor Manick, they both wrote book, several books on system programming, operating system. So they moved the same courses to management school, teach MBA students assembly languages, okay? You know, system programming, okay? So, and uh, so they spent the first lecture is to say, give a huge dose, nothing about programming. We're talking about why MBA students should learn about you know, system programming, should learn about you know, assembly language, okay? So that's the way we handle that. Suddenly later on, I moved to UCA Management School, uh, then I moved to Computer Science in LSU, okay? And so you have to switch the head, okay? <laughs> you may run into similar situation. Uh -huh. what yes. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, one, well, I, I, I want to come back to one of the, the, the things that you mentioned in your presentation and that obviously had a, a, an important influence on you, which was um, the interaction with Charles Beckman when uh, still at Honeywell, right? Charles, you yeah. mentioned he, he won the, the Turing Award and, uh, you know, he proposed the first uh, database um, uh, management systems. And he, he had an idea for his own role based model back then. So could you elaborate a bit on this, on the, how was the interaction with Beck and the influence that, that he had on, on that work, on the ER work? Okay. Uh, there are two kinds of inter influence between he and me. Um, he's something, uh, a senior gentleman I respect, okay, uh, very kind. Uh, <clears throat> Now, so he 
basically, I learned some of the ER model concept from him and also the drawing diagram because he always express what he say in a data structure diagram. Okay? It's a different kind of diagram. So in some way, I was influenced by him. Now later after I published the paper, and he find out this is very become become more uh, widely being adopted. So then he tried to develop something else, and he actually attended a year conference, uh, probably in Germany or whatever, and uh, he you know, published a paper called Partner Partnership Model. Okay, but it didn't get uh, too many responses, attractions. So he gave up there, okay? But uh, I think um, <clears throat> 10 years ago, uh, you know, I nominated him for other awards, the National United States President you know, the Award. So he get that, so he's very heavy. And uh, so <laughs> he and his family invite me several times. So we are in good relationship, okay? Very yes. good. Yeah. Yes, you, you, I mean, the Chup, Chup, I actually three people that uh, stand out in your acknowledgements that they, uh, they are the original ER paper are Cod, of course, and Charles Beckman. But I would also like to hear uh, about your, the, the, the influence that you, you might, uh, you seem to have received from George Milley and his paper, mm -hmm. Another View on Data. George Milley's paper, that paper is the first mention of the word ontology in computer science. So he was mm -hmm. actually making the case that many of the conceptual modeling problems are ontological problems. And uh, so can you can you elaborate on that, on the interaction sure. with George Milley? Sure, okay. George Milley is one of the developers of the <coughs> IBM OS 360 system. And he's very good in system programming, very good in, um, you know, in certain areas. So I, you know, he is actually my advisor, he, you know, official advisor, okay? And uh, so initially, he tried to give me a lot of uh, problem in system programming, okay? For some reason, at the time, I, my brain didn't work. Okay, so <laughs> so I, he asked me to see him every week. Uh, so every week I wrote one short piece of paper and he report because not too much to write. So I locked on his door and uh, I'm glad no his response. Then I slipped the paper under the door and bye bye and then uh, another week. Okay, so that was. Um, <clears throat> You know, but later on, he, mm, um, mm, you know, I spend more time in the medical side. So work with other professors like uh, Professor Jeff Fusen and Professor uh, Hugo Kekaradi, that's in Italian. And uh, okay, actually Professor Hugo Kekaradi uh, later on become the Honeywell um, <coughs> the vice president in charge of about 3,000 engineer people. Okay. Anyway, I think uh, George Milley was very uh, good and gave me a lot of advices. And we initially, I was working on the you know, different kind of control unit of disk, you know, uh, scheduling of disk, all those things. Yeah. Very nice. I didn't know he, he had been your, your official supervisor. Yeah. <laughs> very nice. Uh, talking about ontologies then, I mean, I, one of the reasons, so you, you make this point several times that, uh, that what, what we have in an entity relationship is very natural and it, it's reflected in the structure of several uh, natural languages. And I, ag I agree with that. And I, I think the reason is because there's several different types of natural language are trying to reflect some, something which is even more fundamental which is this kind of ontology underlying cognition, right? So this kind of general categories that we use to create our mental models of reality about objects, about classification, about instantiation, about parthood, about events, 
uh, about relationships and so on, right? So I'm very glad that you mentioned that uh, in the end, the importance of this kind of uh, ontological work. So I have I have an ontological question. I don't know if you had the chance to to think much about this. Uh, when you say that relationships are uh, so from from the beginning, when I I I, I read again, I, I think for the millionth time the original paper, and you were you were making the case that uh, relationships are sets of tuples, right? But relationships are also representations. Uh, let's say the conceptual modern counterparts of of uh, transitive verbs and verbs of course are the linguistic counterpart of events so would you think that when we are representing relationships we are representing events in the world so when you say that we are representing the marriage we are representing a sort of event in which entities participate okay i think uh, even uh, if we look deeper event and relationship should be separated, okay? And uh, your <clears throat> relationship is something um, you is some some kind of a service, okay? An event is something happen, something happen, which creating a status, okay? Or maybe you know, before you have status before the event and status after the event and status during the event okay mm -hmm. so that's, if we say we try to be very precise we have to do that but i think um, in terms of the rotation in terms of the diagram because we try to lump things together we just use one box to say we mm -hmm. you know, more or less the same okay now, certainly, we can use the word like gerund. The, the gerund is like a, some kind of an you know, event, okay? And also, I think um, I remember one of the speakers in this uh, summer uh, series, probably Bernard, talking about you know, some, in some languages only using gerund, okay? Only not no noun, okay? Whatever, or no <coughs> word, okay? So, that's the type of things. So I think, uh, yeah, so we can, what we're trying to say is maybe we can differentiate much, much better, finer, more detailed categories. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, now coming back to the, I, I really like uh, the, you know, the, the connection that you make between conceptual modeling languages and the, these ancient natural languages. Um, one, one aspect that stands out there, however, is that in all these examples of natural language, they are kind of, so the symbols, the concrete syntax, they are representing something which is much less general than ER, for example, right? So you're represent, representing men and woman and water and house and mountains. So this would be analogous to some sort of domain specific language. While at ER, you are proposing something that would really, uh, represent this more, more general categories right like general objects and general relationships so there is a there is a difference uh, there i would say and especially for domain specific language so then it, it it's a uh, it's very clear to me that work much more work would have to be done in concrete syntax in the design in the fundamentals of concrete syntax with something that you've been talking about for a long long time since the paper you mentioned uh, and there are a few, few works in this community on working on visual pragmatics and visual syntax. One, one uh, well-known exception is, of course, Daniel Moody's uh, physics of notation and so on. But why do you think this is the case? Why do you think that the community didn't pay as much attention to aspects of visual syntax since we are dealing with diagrammatic languages? Mm. Can you rephrase what you say with your question? So you 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 mentioned one of the the issues that uh, you may that you brought attention to uh, when connecting ER to Chinese and Egyptian language is the concrete syntax, the visual symbology of the language, right? The visual icons. Um, why do you think uh, that the, the conceptual modeling community 
paid relatively less attention to these aspects of visual syntax as opposed to abstract syntax and formal semantics, for example. Okay. Now, the, uh, the visual syntax is, um, there are not too many things you can represent it there. I think as you pointed out, okay? So in order to make it more complicated, you don't you have to use other type of techniques, okay? So similarly, as you can see the evolution of the Egyptian hieroglyphs, okay? They later on, they initially they used this kind of a, you know, symbols, you know, representing the real world, but later on they uh, moved to a more phonetic base type of you know, language. Okay? And uh, so, <clears throat> because in terms of sound, you can pre represent it much more. Okay? And uh, in the, using the graphic symbol, you are limited by the number of things you can represent. Okay? Okay? You have to put a lot of things together to mean something, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, there are several types of restrictions. You know, in, in the language, like a Chinese character is kanji, it's basically a square. You have to write something in a box. So no matter how complicated, it has to be in a certain, the same size of square, okay? So, but in the Egyptian hieroglyph, you are free for all. You can be a bigger, you're smaller, okay? So that's a good, that's a freedom. You can put more. But if the problem is, in the people trying to understand, decipher, they don't know where's the boundary, what's the boundary, okay? So that's a part of the reason it took so many years to figure out, okay? You don't know. In Chinese, it's easy because everything, you just need a square to look at, move the square, and you can understand, okay? Try to understand. Now, <clears throat> go back to your question. You know, the sound you can represent much more. In many languages, uh, I think um, I may be a little bit <clears throat> naive in that because in English, most people in the <clears throat> Westerner try to learn Chinese. They find out, oh, how come there are four tons? Okay? I, they couldn't, many people couldn't decide, figure out, like, ah, 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 you, 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 okay? So even the same song will have four different tones, okay? Mm. Now, so that's, they find out that's the most difficult things to learn, okay? Or to, to understand when you listen to people's talk. Now, <clears throat> actually, in the, in some of the dialects, in the, if people go to Hong Kong, they speak Cantonese. They not only have four sounds, four tones, they have nine tones, okay? Everything, have, you can change the nine kind of you know, levels, okay? So what do I mean? What I try to say is, even one particular sound, say, a a a a a so you have, have nine variations. I mean, just one song. Then you put several songs together. You can express the meaning quicker, faster. Okay? So, so the phonetic language is in some way mm. more advanced. Okay? I, I see. Well, by, by the way, one, one, uh, one character, one uh, ideogram that I like very much is the prisoner. Uh, ideogram that you showed because it you know prisoner is a role right so a kind of dynamic class someone can become a prisoner and cease to be a prisoner and you can actually see that in the icon you can basically imagine the character for person being able to enter and leave the box right so i think it's very interesting i'll start to using that <laughs> Peter, let me <laughs> Let me move a little bit uh, to, to ER now. Uh, you mentioned this very nice paper by Alberto Lander and, and colleagues on, the, on a very careful analysis of the 40 years of the conference. And um, it's quite nice to see that the conference is still alive. It's growing the number of 
of papers. It's renovating its community uh, and so on. So uh, I imagine you, you couldn't have imagined that you were in 1979 creating a community that would cross four, day, four decades alive and growing, right? Yes, I think it's uh, not only a surprise to me, but to many people, because not too many conferences can survive for such a long time, and also without association with your IEEE, ACM, or European Society, whatever. It's an independently run, so it's very rare, okay? Even in you know, those conferences associated with your know, societies, they disappear, okay, very quickly, okay? They will change the name very quickly. So this is uh, something certainly, uh, I think it's demonstrated to an observation. It's a group of people, uh, and actually many groups of people, you know, from each time is running by a different group. So that's, you know, continue to work on that. And there are more and more things to develop. Okay? It's not something where they finish. Okay, the job not finished yet. Okay, not much more to do. Okay? Yes, I'm, I'm sure we're going to have this conversation again in, uh, in the 50th anniversary of ER in, uh, in 2030. Uh, do you see any, any risk to the community and the conference with this new, um, I want to avoid saying obsession, but uh, focus with, uh, with uh, machine learning and things of that sort? Or do you think that con conceptual modeling uh, it's the contrary. Conceptual model, the role of conceptual model will be highlighted by these new applications. Okay. I think uh, <clears throat> what I see is um, um, it's basically uh, I look at things for a different way. One is a top down, the other is a bottom up. Okay. Machine learning, as well as uh, <clears throat> data mining, is more bottom up. You have a lot of data. You try to figure out what's going on about data. Okay? So, no matter what you do, you need, I think you, first you need both sides, bottom up and top down. Okay? But uh, you always need to have some kind of a model in your mind. Okay? That's a long time ago when I debate with people talking about functional dependencies. I already argued, what is the function of dependency? You have to have concept of entities within your mind in, in order to define your functional dependency. Same thing as whether you do your machine learning, your big data, you try to process that, you have to have some kind of model, mental model. Okay? You may not have exactly, you have some kind of the model, you try to test the model is correct or not. Okay? Without the model, it won't work. Okay? So, you know, <clears throat> so what I see is that one research can be done is you know, how to make these two things you know, more integrated, you know, more uh, can be <clears throat> help each other. Okay? Mm -hmm. Very good. Another thing that they highlight that I like very much is the fact that you have this mix mixture of new people entering the community, but uh, a, a core of people that have been following the community uh, across these four decades, right? And um, I was checking again the, the proceedings of the very first ER, and you still see people at ER that were there. Uh, for example, Carlo Battini or uh, Bill McCarthy that sometimes uh, attends ER as well and, and other yes. people. So this is also quite nice huh? yes. that you have people that have been um, joined the community and, and keeps following. So there is this critical mass, right, that keeps uh, attending the, the, the conference. Uh, in all this time, so one another thing they mentioned in that paper is that uh, new topics have been introduced to ER, which are very much related to conceptual modeling, but not so much to data modeling, like uh, I-STAR and, uh, and Go modeling, uh, process modeling, ontologies, and so on. So here, here's my, let's say, my final two questions. 
was there something in these four decades that really surprised you in the conference that uh, you you did not uh, for you, you you didn't see coming as a topic in conceptual modeling and was there something that you thought it would have been solved by now and it isn't and we still have work to do um what i find out is um you both from the theory and from the practical side the integration of data modeling and process modeling still not integrated okay so that's puzzles me i thought it, it could be it should be done much earlier okay mm -hmm. so but i still find out not only in theory but also you go to companies you don't see that okay you see a different group working on their own things okay so that's uh, that could be not very desirable Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. So I'll move to the questions from the audience now. Okay. Sure. So the first one is uh, thank you for, for your talk, Professor Chen. Considering that computers could not support modeling as they do today, I imagine that most models were built on paper back then. Did that uh, shape or limit the definition of the ER language in some way? Did that affect adoption, in your opinion? Uh, yes, I think so. I think um, it's um, yeah. At that time, if you use paper, yeah, you know, certain things are very difficult to draw. Okay, and uh, if you are designing using a computer, using computerized tools, it's much easier to draw. So the graphic symbol icon could be different. And uh, the way uh, may have a reverse impact on how you think, okay? Because you are influencing the rules, but the, the, the tools, the tool may help may influence you, okay? Thank you. Okay, we are <clears throat> you know, we are restricted by the limit of the tools or by the capability of the tools, okay? So the answer yes. Mm -hmm. OK, so the second question is Chinese philosophy has yin and yang. The ER language has entities and relationships. Do you see entities and relationships as opposites? OK, uh, the answer is no. I see them as complementary. OK, I don't see them as opposite. I think um, <clears throat> you the entity relationship uh, is complement each other. You have entities. The entity, your two entities have with different kind of relationships. Okay? You could be the classmates together. You could be sitting together. You could be hating another person on a certain aspect, but you like him in another aspect. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's a it's a different. It's not yin and yang, not opposite, okay? Okay. Um, do you think it's the case that any natural language must necessarily embody some principles of conceptual modeling? Do you think there are open research questions in the area of the relationship between natural languages and conceptual mod modeling languages? Um, yes. You you highlight some of this, right? Some open problems uh, in the relation between natural language and conceptual modeling. Uh, is there something else you'd like to add? Do you think that, uh, you know, we should, you know, people in linguistics, they look at language as a window into human cognition, right? Do you think we should look at conceptual models in a similar way? The way people express things diagrammatically review uh, somehow the way they, they Build conceptual mental models in their minds? Yes, the answer is yes. Okay, let me give uh, a similar example. Um, <clears throat> I talk about the Chinese character composition. Okay, character composition. And I'm um, talking about the person, your, your prisoner, your, and then you, your subset, everything. Now, in in the Chinese culture or society, 
Oriental, not just Chinese, Oriental, East Oriental Church Society. So you have some uh, fortune tellers, people telling you about your fortune. Right? In here, they may look at the Oracle board or whatever, Oracle, to see, oh, or look at the, 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 the cards, play cards. You pick the one card and then give you uh, some prediction, okay? What, whether you should go to a certain place or not, whether you still do, do things or not, you buy certain stock or not, whatever. Now, in the <clears throat> kanji type of culture, they are picking a word, okay? You go to see, you go to see a fortune teller, say, I want to know my fortune this year, next year. They say, okay, think, think about a word. Okay, you think about wood. I like the word prisoner. Okay, then they will <coughs> take that, decompose that, <coughs> and then give you some your know, explanation. Okay, now why why that sometimes is correct? Because this is my guess. Because you are always thinking certain things, and in some way your mind is compose that kind of characters okay in your mind and then people ask you you just show that pull that out so to answer that gentleman's question or the lady's question it's basically same thing okay you are you know the graphic will also influence you okay this the model also influence you yes okay because also from that we can detect that okay so there are a lot of people doing this kind of you know, human wave research to see you know, what, you know, what you're thinking, okay? Even if you don't speak, okay? Uh, we can guess what you think, so okay? So <laughs> from the character, give me a character. <laughs> so you give me a character, Very good. you can see whether you should be uh, going out this evening or not. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, so the, the next question is about, you mentioned about these principles of resemblance and naturalness, which relates the, 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 the icon, uh, the sign, with what it's supposed to represent. However, in, in classical semiotics, there is this idea of the arbitrary, arbitrary nature of the, of the sign, the idea that signs, the concrete syntax is somehow arbitrary. Have you thought about this, and uh, how how would you reconcile these two ideas? Why do you say science is arbitrary? Yeah, I mean this works for natural language, but actually, if I, I'm just reproducing the question. But also in natural language, there are some studies that show that proto uh, a proto syntax also reflects. It's not arbitrary. That's why we say tiny and uh, petit. Right in the sense that these things uh, resemble the sound resembles somehow the the thing which is being represented. Uh, so maybe not even in natural language, at least in the beginning of the the, the formation of the of natural language, this was arbitrary. But you because you were you were emphasizing this right the the notion that the concrete syntax somehow should reflect the nature of the thing that it's, it's representing. That's correct. Okay, I. The answer is this way, because when this is my guess, I try to figure how how the language evolved, why people develop a certain type of meaning associated with the particular symbol, particular character. Basically, when you let's say you try to put the mouth and the bird together, or together two 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 characters become one characters, you you basically have several possible meaning, okay? Okay, yes, so the question is, could yeah. be arbitrary, yes, okay? However, there's a convention, so human society impose to say, okay, let's make this meaning, or maybe use that to mean more and more frequently that way. So then other people learn that, they will start to use this same way, when they try to express certain meaning, they use that particular symbol. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a reinforced type of learning. 
Yes, I mean, what you, what you, you call the resemblance or naturalness is what uh, Daniel Moody calls perceptual uh, immediacy as well in his framework. Right? Mm -hmm. um, you talk a lot about graphical as aspects of conceptual modeling. Is there a role to be played by textual forms of conceptual modeling as well? Or maybe the combination of the two? I mean, building models which are partially textual, partially graphical, in your opinion? Yes. I think uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes, as we already talked about, just a graphic symbol is not sufficient, okay? Or not precise. So you need some texture thing to supplement that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as you can see, some of the graphic icon design, sometimes they have a word, you know, text associated with, it, okay? So that can you can narrow down or also as a way to train you, to, to train you so that next time you see that symbol, you know what I mean. Particularly when we talk, we talk about highway sign, you can see something, say, crossing. See, they would put a railroad, railroad crossing, whatever. Mm -hmm. They add some words there, okay? Or they say, okay, fire, whatever, okay? So it's not just a symbol. So sometimes they put something there. So you know it's a warning. Not worrying about any chemical, worry about fire, or worry about mm -hmm. chemical. Okay, so you have to some combinations. Okay, so texture is text is also text can be used as another kind of symbols. Okay, text is not just a different thing, right? Mm -hmm. it's a symbol, right? Yes. Do you have suggestions on how to make models and language more accessible to different cultures? Or do you see this is a mostly an open issue? I see that uh, open issue, okay? I think, um, so that's I keep on the preach. Um, people try to design certain things. They have to be careful on the, you know, the audience, what kind of audience going to use it so that they can design things that offending and more natural to the particular audience. Okay? Now there, there's no way to know for sure uh, because if you are not in that particular culture, it's difficult to figure out. Okay? For example, we all know in some places your know, certain color is good, some places red color is good, some places red color is no good, okay? So, but yeah, you need to be you know, careful on that. <clears throat> Thank you for the wonderful talk and inspiring ideas. Actually, many people are thanking you here, uh, Peter, and saying that the R is the first thing they learned in conceptual modeling and so on. Uh, do you think language can be restructured, re-engineered to incorporate some theoretical foundations so they can be directly used in design modeling? So I think I think the question is is uh, it relates to this idea of bridging conceptual modeling and implementation in a way that is more directly, right? So Oscar talks a lot about this as well. This idea and and Bernard also talk about this. This idea of uh, no extreme non-programming, conceptual modeling, replacing system design in programming directly, and not only as a tool, as an intermediate step. Yes, I agree with that, and I preach that too. Okay, I try to push that too. Okay, so what we need is we do need some uh, both the language design and also need some prototype implementation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now there is talking about Bernard, there is a question from him. <laughs> he says, uh, the set of Chinese composition principles can be extended to the cognitive uh, structures, such as the one proposed by Lakoff, uh, the, the, the cognitive science. For example, link schema, center periphery schema, oil stain, for example, source path go, um, linear ordering, and so on. Uh, how can you incorporate such construction principles? Okay, talking about the ordering, right? Yeah. Okay. The, <clears throat> the ordering, so we have to 
know how to you know uh, how to order okay you could be just uh, left to right could be right to left or could be uh, circulating i think uh, for kanji it's always any th three direction left to right right to left and top down okay so depending on <coughs> what you prefer you can choose particular one but it, uh, certainly a society or government can force people to do a certain ways okay now i think uh, <coughs> in terms of our uh, modeling language or conceptual modeling language we can also <coughs> You know, set some rules so that you know everybody can adapt to that. You know. So if we choose to do that, okay. Mm -hmm. Now there is maybe the last uh, question. So there is one question, actually a couple of questions from Thomas uh, Jonsson, uh, and it refers to our discussion about events and relationships. So mm -hmm. so he defends that something like a marriage should be modeled as an entity uh, and not a relationship exactly because it's an event um, in his view that uh, you know has a, it connects to many things the legal contract the participation of the spouses um, um, the, the the location which the marriage happens and so on so there is some complexity there right um, I, I i would add something to this um, events i mean there are some there is this view of events as just a transition, but often we want to represent events with their properties, their relationships, forming taxonomies and things like that, right? Uh, so do you think there is still research to be done on how to incorporate these more sophisticated models of events in traditional conceptual modeling languages? Okay, <clears throat> now let's look at the marriage. If it's a marriage, uh, <clears throat> It's basically a event or a status, okay? Event, okay? The marriage, um, marriage ceremony is an event, okay? The marriage is a um, is a entity. You know, you can look at that, but when you say somebody A is married to B, that's a relationship, okay? It's a, you have some kind of a, you know, things association with each other. That's the relationship. So the event, and uh, <clears throat> there's also something called activities. So you have activities. Your your marry uh, ceremony sometimes activities, okay? Mm -hmm. You have multiple multiple events going on one of another okay so <clears throat> so depending on what you look at so you have either an entity or either a relationship okay right mm -hmm. entity could be a, you know, multiple entity participating in that okay? mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember that in this uh, paper, the first paper, the 83 paper in which you connect the R to the English grammar, you mentioned this idea that um, that sometimes that you have a, a clause uh, refined as some sort of relationship. So often you have this with relationships, right? The enrollment, mm -hmm. the employment, the marriage and so on, because you want to represent the properties of the marriage and you want to represent that the marriage can change as well right it can go for right. example from partial separation of assets to full separation of assets and so on so sometimes you need more than just the, the link right right that's cool peter, peter the, i i could spend the the whole day here talking to you uh, <laughs> but i think we have to to wrap it up there are many many people thanking you for the great talk and uh, and uh, I joined them. Thank you very, very much for the generosity of offering this talk and answering all these questions. It was great Thank having you. you here. Thank you. Appreciate it.